to eschew your teacher. Teach us at a high school. Okay, so we're back. We looked at why do we live like we live. I do this because of what he's done for me. Um, so we've looked at why, but now I want us to look at how. So did everybody get a handout for the second session that says recall, remember, and record? Everybody get one? Y'all good. Way to go. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So what I have done is, and I'm going to be sure that I am set for, uh, I want to be sure that I give you guys time to ask some questions. Okay, so if you have a question, just write it down so that you don't forget. And I'm going to give you time at the end of the thing. So uh, we're going to pray real quick. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you, let this be clear. Let it make sense, everything that we look at. How do we go about living a life, uh, the life, uh, actually, Lord, that you have called us to live. And so, make it plain. In your name I pray. Amen. So, on your handout, it will say, recall, remember, record with pen, paper, and a Bible. So, if I, was, if I could only have three things for quiet time. That's what I'd want. Blank paper, pen, and a Bible. Okay? Now, I got lots of other stuff, and you've already heard me talking about all these books over here. There are a lot of books I use. But, basically, what I want to do, I want to help you get to the place where, do you remember in here, pen, paper, and a Bible. With a few glasses, and we always have gum, girl. <laughs> There's always gum in there, just in case. Um, so, let me tell you when this became really sweet for me. We were missionaries living in Ecuador, and I lived on a sheep trail. I literally, women walked past. I lived at the foot of a beautiful volcano, Mount Chimborazo, and I've got friends that just landed in Ecuador yesterday, and uh, they were from North Greenville, gone on a trip, and I was terribly jealous I was not with them. Anyway, I literally lived on a sheep trail, and women walked past my house grazing their sheep and spinning wool. When I was in Ecuador, it was 1991, it was before the days of personal computers, surely before the days of a cell phone. So everything I carried in English was all that I had to use. And I did carry a bunch of my books, but I could not get any English, and I hate to tell you, I wasn't very good in Spanish. Um, I couldn't get any English radio, English TV, podcasts were not a thing. Um, I couldn't buy any English books. So after I'd been there about six months, I'd gone through all the books that I had carried, and there were no other English speakers in my town. And I literally had the feeling of, who is going to teach me? How am I going to grow spiritually? My husband was my pastor, but he preached in English and I, excuse me, in Spanish. And I had a Bible that was Spanish on one side and English on the other. And while he's preaching, I'm trying to sit there and conjugate verbs and figure out, oh, that's how you say that in the future tense. I, I was terrible in Spanish. So church became a grammar lesson, if you can appreciate that. Not that I meant to, it's just the way it always ended up. We had been there about six months and I just told the Lord, I was like, well, I guess I just won't grow spiritually. There's no way for me to grow. And seriously, it's like the Lord said, well, honey, what I do, could I be your teacher? And there is a great verse in Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 4, that says the Lord has given me, the Lord has given me an instructed tongue. He wakens me morning by morning to give me a word to sustain the weary. He teaches me like one being taught. And literally the Lord said, just let me be your teacher. And there this was all I had. I had a Bible, I had paper, and I had pen. And that's kind of when I fell in love with this little simplistic thing. So we're literally, you know why I don't use blanks? You know, a lot of people use a handout that's got all these blanks. But then I get real nervous about the blanks because I forget to fill them in. So we didn't even do blanks. So this is what you are looking at your paper is this thing right here. One of the best things anybody ever taught me, and it was actually a weight loss class, and the lady who did the weight loss class came walking in with a basket, and she said, I keep all of my quiet time things in one basket. And that was years ago, and to this day, I still do it. And I will tell you this too. 
Now, for your sake, I mean, you probably feel like your bedroom is your space. It's not like you've got an apartment for the most of you or even other places in the house. Your bedroom is your quiet place. And so you've probably got all your things in a bedroom. I, when I did college girls, you know, it wasn't like they had a living room to go walk into. They just had a dorm room. But in my house, I got lots of space in there. So if I don't have what I need right with me, I can be guilty of thinking, oh, I think that's over in my bedroom. And so then I go to my bedroom, and there I say, uh-oh, I've got these dirty clothes. I better go throw those in the wash. I, throw, I mean, literally, I can do that, and 30 minutes later, all my quiet time's gone because I've been running around chasing things and looking for things. So now it all stays in my basket. And I even put my coffee in a little thermos carafe so that I can take it with me and don't have to leave my space because I will get sidetracked, okay? And then I end up losing my time. So it says right here, I actually begin my day with a calendar. Now, I used to be able to, could, I could remember everything I was supposed to do that day. I can't remember what I'm supposed to do. So when I very first wake up, this doesn't sound terribly spiritual, but here's the deal. It lets me know what needs to be done that day so that I'm not sitting there preoccupied thinking, oh, I hope I don't forget such and such. No, it's written in here. I know exactly what I got to do. So now I can take that out of my mind and not think about it. Now, it goes on to say, I know what I need to do. I can remember something. I'm not preoccupied. I don't think I put this in here, but we're just going to all smile and say, I taught weight loss for 12 years. And when I taught it, you had to keep a food diary. Do you know I still keep a food diary? So the, I'm not teaching that class anymore, but I'm going to tell you why I keep a food diary. Because it helps me to keep a, just an eyeball on, am I taking care of this temple? Because this is the temple of the Lord. Am I taking care of it? Because it's the only one I've got. So if I don't keep it exercised, and if I don't give it the nutrition it needs, I don't feel good. And when I don't feel good, I'm going to do ministry or anything else half-hearted. So I keep up with, am I eating all donuts or am I actually eating a vegetable every once in a while? And I just keep a record of it, and it kind of tells me that. And then you're going to crack up. This is a lovely book. I bought at Ollie's for $3. And it is Shaping the New You. And it's one of those books that really, it's just a little chicken soup for the soul stories, but it's all about exercise. And it keeps me wanting to move this body so that, I don't just get sluggish and just sit back in a recliner and let the days go by. No, I really try to do it. How many of y'all wear a Fitbit and keep up with your steps? Anybody? Oh, nobody. I'm loving you. She keeps up with her steps. You're going to be a drummer, aren't you? I was watching you during the music. You're going to be the Jim Bay girl. You were so good, and you were right on beat, too. You were doing great. Anyway, so to get 10,000 steps is the goal on a Fitbit. Girls, I did 25,000 steps last Monday. Would somebody please give me a little hand? Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I, I seriously try to feel good so that I can feel like ministering. Okay, so I keep up with that. That's part of my quiet time. Now we're going to move to pen and blank pages so that you can recall the events of yesterday. So I want to talk to you about uh, gratitude and how I journal. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to talk all through this instead of reading it out to you. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to tell you an added benefit to being grateful, okay? This is just an added benefit. And then we're going to look at the Scripture, and the Scripture calls you, Jesus calls you to be grateful for, what you, for everything he's done for us. And we'll look at that. But I learned something one time. I was teaching about gratitude, and a holistic doctor that does the homeopathic stuff, you know, it's not like the typical medical doctor. Anyway, she pulled the chair up to where I was, and she said, I'm going to tell you something. Okay, so if you get poison ivy, and it's itching like crazy, or if you get hives or something and it itches, you know how you'll go and get an ice pack to put on there to chill on that? There's a reason for that. And extreme heat will actually do the same thing. I put a hair dryer on poison ivy, and it'll kill the itch. Because the temperature, the, the, the extreme hot and cold, and itch 
run on the same nerve. Now, this is what she told me. They run on the same nerve. Therefore, extreme cold or extreme hot will override the itch. That's why you do that, okay? And then she said, don't ask me how anybody tested this, but it sounded good to me, and so I'm going to teach it to you because I'm believing it's true. She said, gratitude and anxiety run on the same nerve. And gratitude will override anxiety. Okay, so you hear that? When you get nervous, when you get anxious, when you start worrying about something, if you can flip your brain over to make a choice to be grateful, and sometimes you've got to look hard to find what can you be grateful for, then it will override that anxiety. So, there's your, there's your one reason to, do, to be grateful. Here's another one. So in, and this is all in your notes here, but in Lamentations, so Lamentations is just five chapters, and it is a book of lament, which is weeping. And we call Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations, the weeping prophet because he wept over Jerusalem. That he was telling them, you know, the verse, I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope. That verse is sandwiched in between him saying, I really hate it, but y'all are going into 70 years of captivity. However, God knows the plans he has for you, has for you to give you a future and a hope, but first you're going into captivity. So it's a wonderful verse, but it's stuck in the middle of some pretty terrible news. Because of their idolatry, God was going to haul them off and Babylon would come and carry away the southern kingdom of Judah. So they did not like what he had to say, and they would throw him in prison all the time because they didn't like what he was saying. It was like, God will never let Jerusalem be conquered. But Jerusalem was conquered. So that's the book of Jeremiah. And then you come to Lamentations where he is lamenting over Jerusalem. It's a book of pretty much five really sad chapters, except the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, comes right in the middle of that book where it talks about great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see now that starts in Lamentations 3.22 I want to tell you a powerful verse Lamentations 3.21 Jeremiah will say yet even though all this rotten stuff I've just said in chapters 1 chapters 2 and chapter 3 up to verse 20 in verse 21 he says yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. If there's just this tiny little bright spot in the middle of a really hard book. And when I discovered that, what I realized was, Lord, I need to make a conscious choice to recall your goodness to me. I've been keeping a journal. Do I have journalers? I need to see hands. There we go. I love it, love it, love it. Do not stop. Um, so I, I had a diary when I was young. But when I was 21, I moved to journaling with, the, you know, the, paper, the, the you know, little pretty books and stuff. And at first it felt a little awkward. But then finally somebody really showed me how to turn my journal into prayers so that my journal begins with, Dear Lord. I mean, it really is a morning prayer. I usually tell the Lord, Good morning. I'm sure he appreciates it. I always write it in there, Good morning, Lord. Thanks for a good night's sleep. So... In 2000, no, in uh, years ago, it was back in the 90s, I started putting thank you before all the paragraphs in my journal and just to teach me gratitude. And then in 2014, a girl, a lady named Ann Voskamp, some of y'all might follow her. She has blogs and podcasts and junk. And um, because of some trauma in her childhood, she was now in her 30s carrying oppression just the sadness her baby sister had been killed on the farm and she had seen all of that and when she was now in her 30s she just carried a heaviness from that and somebody said you ought to put a journal on your kitchen countertop and every time you see the goodness of God just record it just write it down and see if you can't get to a thousand and she got to the a thousand a thousand gifts is the name of the book I read the book, and I thought, hmm, I'm going to see if I can get to 1,000. So I started numbering the things I was thankful for. Girls, this morning I numbered 17,856. 
I've been doing that since 2014. Just So this is what I do. I grab my journal and I look at what number. I try to write at least five things every day. Some days I might write three pages worth because i got a lot of time. If I'm in a hurry, I'll just put the numbers one, two, three, four, five. I'll just put whatever the next five numbers are. And I will think today about what I did yesterday, and then I will thank the Lord for that. Now, if I wake up, and I feel anxious. I feel anxiety right here. This is where I feel anxious. I can tell it in my stomach. It's a literal physical feeling of I feel anxious. If I wake up and feel anxious, go get my coffee. Go get in my red chair beside my basket. Pull out my journal and start remembering everything God did for me just yesterday. Then all of a sudden that anxiety starts going away because if the father took care of me yesterday he's going to take care of me today so this morning I can tell you what I put in my journal uh thank you so much Lord that yesterday morning I had a good long morning with you my husband got off to Jordan I had a long morning I have this precious student he is so sweet he was one of my boys when he was at school somebody brought him to my house for dinner when they told me his name um it, it I have a friend his name is Will Snipes well, never married. He teaches in the public school, Madeline. You know him. And he disciples all these boys that come out of Blue Ridge. And then every once in a while, about three times a year, he'll call me up. He's single. And he'll say, hey, can I bring some boys to your house for dinner? Well, on this particular night, it was only one boy. And he introduced him to me. And I heard his name. And I said, honey, do you go to North Greenville? And he said, yes, ma'am. And I said, did your daddy die yesterday? And he said, yes, ma'am. And his daddy had died Monday, an accidental drug overdose, was going to be buried on Thursday. God brought him to me on that Tuesday. He is still my boy. He is 24 years old. I love him so much. He lives in Atlanta. He got married in Utah this summer. If he's home from Atlanta, he'll usually let me know, hey, can I come by for coffee? And I usually make him one piece of cinnamon toast and one piece of cheese toast and we sit and drink coffee and have so much fun together. I love him. So you know what my journal says? Thank you for my Nathan and just thank you for giving me time with him. Thank you that I then went and had lunch with all my elementary school friends. Believe it or not, I'm telling you the truth. We, a lot of us moved back to Greer and we went and all had lunch together and laughed our heads off. Um, thank you, God, that I got to go and do a little shopping because my granddaughter's getting a sandbox. And I went and got sand for the sandbox so that, because that, she's getting the sandbox for me. Thank you, God, that I could get that taken care of. Thank you so much. I've got some homeschoolers. How many homeschoolers have I got in here? Oh, praise the Lord. I love it. So one of my little families homeschools through Classical Conversations. And last night they did all their, do y'all do presentations where you become Joan of Arc and somebody of, uh, I did Aquitaine, who was that? Somebody of Aquitaine, that was one of my granddaughters. Anyway, I went to their little presentation, had the time of my life. All of that stuff goes into that journal. Thank you, God, thank you that I live here. Thank you that my grandchildren are close by. I can just jump in the car and go celebrate their victories with them. Thank you, God. Okay, you've listened to all of that. None of that is big monumental stuff. It's, none of that is real big, you know. But, oh, my goodness, I had a fabulous day. And I am so grateful that the Lord allowed the fabulous day. So those things get written in my journal. Um, I also, I keep three pens beside my journal. Because do you remember all scriptures God breathes is useful for teaching and training that goes in green for helping me grow or rebuking and correcting if I feel like the Lord is really speaking to me through the scripture to correct me or rebuke me then I will write that in red I have a particular ministry that I do that if I feel like God is speaking to that ministry that goes in purple all of that goes into my journal so that as the Lord is speaking to me I can keep up with it. It's easy to find. It's easy to recall. Um, and then also, I don't know if y'all like podcasts, but if you hear something that's especially wonderful, 
Write it down. Write it down. Remember, record. And that's where those things get recorded so that I can remember. Oh, I think that was back in the spring when I heard that. And then I can go flip through my books and I can find all that stuff. One other thing, and this is in your book um, or on your handout thing, and that is this. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances. Um, and I'm going to illustrate that for you. However, Ephesians 5.20 says give thanks for all things. Those are very different, what are those, uh, prepositions. To give thanks in a circumstance, but to give thanks for a circumstance is very different. And I've always used this illustration because I've never had a wreck before, but this was my illustration. Okay, to give thanks in my circumstances. Thank you, God, that I was not hurt. Thank you, God, it's just a car. Thank you, God, there was insurance. That would be... The circumstances around the wreck. And that's easy enough to say thanks for. But to say thank you for the wreck is altogether different, isn't it? You know, I can thank him in the circumstances, but to thank him for the hard thing is hard. So three weeks ago, guess what? First time ever, somebody pulled out of a gas station and just took the front end of my car off. I mean, took the whole thing off. It was totaled. It was gone. And I sat there, my first thought was, oh, no, am I supposed to say thank you for this wreck? <laughs> I don't want to say thank you for the wreck. Uh, but you know what? The man was insured. The man, it wasn't hit and run. The man was worried about me. He came over and he said, are you okay? I am so sorry. The tow truck driver arrived. We knew him. I'm just telling you, God was so good to us in the middle of every bit of that. And all of that goes into the thank you. Okay, keep moving with me. Now we're going to move to the Word. Have yourself a reading plan so that you're not randomly picking up the Bible, hoping to find something good for the day. Your plan is your plan. And it will not necessarily look like somebody else's plan. Your goal is to know God. And you want to know Him in the fullness of His revelation. Some uh, passages of Scripture are just hard. I just got through jo uh, Joshua. Oh, there's enough Joshua. Uh, there's enough blood in the book of Joshua to kill somebody. You know, uh, some, some portions are hard. Okay. Um, but if God included even the hard portions in his revelation of himself, then it is valuable and doesn't need to be skipped over. Halley's Bible Handbook was especially helpful to me. That's this little book right here. And it's old. Guess how old I was when I got this book? 14 years old. Guess how old I was when I opened this book? 44 years old. And I kept this book all that time and never used it one time. But my best friend's mother was the one who wrote in, in, the, in the, the book. And it had my name in it. And I never would, like, throw it in a goodwill pile, you know. And um, anyway, then when I was 40, 44 years old, I discovered that book was really helpful in understanding some of the hard stuff in Scripture and how some of the hard stuff in Scripture connects with other stuff in Scripture to make it make just a little bit more sense. And that book's good and old now, so you know, they always cheat. Okay, come down. As you read, you're going to pull out another notebook. Uh, I had somebody come to my house one time, and she said, could I just come and look at all your notebooks you keep talking about? So for me, I've got a journal where I'm recording, really, yesterday. This right here is what I pick up when I pick up the Word of God. Do you remember that it said, it is the Word of God that will thoroughly equip you for every good work. So if you're going to get equipped and God's going to teach you stuff, you need to write it down. So I'm just going to tell you, uh, I got here a little early. I bought the wrong kind of sand yesterday for the sandbox. So I bought sand that you put between pavers, and there was a big thing that said, keep out of reach of children. And I was like, oh, my word, this is for my grandchild. I better I swap this out for play sand. And it didn't take long at all, and so I had some extra time. So when I pulled in here today, I didn't get all my reading done in Scripture this morning. I want to show you what I read um, when I was sitting outside in the parking lot. I was in Judges chapter 8, and I had just finished up the whole story of Gideon. And, you know, Gideon is pretty remarkable because he was so timid, so shy, 
And God said, I really am going to use you. It will be me fighting this battle. God even lets him go to the other camp, the enemy camp, and hear the enemy saying, oh no. It was somebody was trying to interpret a dream. And they said, it must mean that Gideon's coming after us. So God even let him see, your enemy's scared of you. He has this incredible battle, and he wins. Okay, now I just want you to listen. I'm in Judges chapter 8. And the battle has been won. He's done amazing things. And in verse 22, the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, dash, you, your son, your grandson, because you have saved us out of the hand of Midian. But right, listen to this. This is so important. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. And so they said, we'll be glad to give them to you. Um, guess what? Just come on down to verse 27. You, you just won't believe how, how quickly we go from being brilliant and wise and obedient to being stupid. Um, so he asked for earrings. They gave him earrings. And look at verse 27. Gideon made all the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. You know, I read that this morning. Now, I didn't have my book literally sitting. My God said, I call it a God said. It's a, what did God say to me? Um, but when I get home, I will record in there. How quickly we go from being wholehearted followers and doing great things for God and then just being an idiot. You know, I mean, how stupid was that? Give me your earrings. I'm going to basically make you a little idol. And then they all sat there and worshiped. And we look at it in Scripture and think, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But you and I can do the same thing. We can go from an incredible spiritual high and then all of a sudden kind of kick back and get a little bit lazy and then do a foolish thing. So... That would go into this book, and I would put it will go into this book when I get home, and I will put Judges eight, and I will put the scripture down, and I will date it, and then I will say, "Oh Lord Jesus, please help me to be smarter than that. Don't let me do foolish things like that, especially foolish things that would lead others astray." So I will write those things down. Okay, moving on. Um, that's my God said book. Okay, I got some Jill Brannion friends in here. So, they know Jill Brannion. Jill Brannion is getting ready to retire. If you come to North Greenville, she will be gone. Um, she was a missionary to Kenya. She has a very deep voice. And a lot of people are scared of her because she has a deep voice. Um, my husband's scared of her. But I love Jill. <laughs> I love Jill. She's one of my favorite people in the whole wide world and she knows it and the reason I love her so much is you know what I know she loves me anyway Jill's taught me something that's really good and it's very helpful all right can I take we're gonna hang that on a pause for just a second I'll step over here and I'll tell you something my church is doing because I think this is real important at the beginning of the year they had three bracelets that you could pick from and I hate to tell you I don't have mine on today um I I chose the black bracelet but you could get a gray bracelet or you could get a white bracelet. If you got the gray bracelet, um, if you got the black bracelet, they gave you a reading plan that looks like this. And from January till the end of December, I, in my black reading plan, will have read all the way through Scripture. Some people chose a gray reading plan. The gray reading plan is... I'm going to read all the way through the New Testament this year. Then you could pick a white reading plan. And the white bracelet was 15 verses a day. So that if you've never been in Scripture, you're not all of a sudden having to read four chapters every day. No, you got 15 verses. Or if you have little children. So um, my little, little one who said, I want to get my yip, she actually calls it yip stick because she can't say else. I want to get this yip stick off so I can fuck my thumb. Um, her, they're doing the white reading plan because they are five and three, getting ready to be four, five and three and eight months old. And so January 1 came, 
and they pulled out their Bible, and their daddy read their 15 verses. By January 4, Livy sat down to eat breakfast and said, Daddy, get your Bible, because she already knew we we're going to be doing our reading plan. Now, this is what I love about this. I had a woman, she's 28 years old, she's a mother of two, and she was in my office this week. And she said, Miss Ruth, can I just tell you, I got the black band, and I'm drowning. I am so behind in my Bible reading. And I just got up from where I was, and I went and got her the white reading plan. And I said, honey, that's a terrible place to be, is to feel like I've just got to read a whole book to get caught up. No, uh-uh, uh-uh. Ann Graham Lotz would say, we don't read Scripture just to get through it. We read Scripture for God to be able to speak to us. So your reading plan needs to fit your life. And I'm not going to tell you what that reading plan ought to be. There was, I love to read through Scripture every year, but there was one year where I had a new study Bible, and it was half the, half the page of Scripture, half was study notes. So you know what? I took two years because it took twice as long to read the Scripture and the study notes. So I gave myself two years to work my way all the way through there. But this is what I learned from Dr. Brain is and it was just great she is ever the school teacher and she said every morning get yourself two sticky notes and on one sticky note you are going to write goodness on the other sticky note this is on your notes you're going to write guidance and she said as you're reading the scripture she had learned this from her pastor bruce schmidt who died last year she said my pastor taught me how to live and he taught me how to die and her pastor had said, every morning when I am reading Scripture, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for something in Scripture that shows me God's goodness, and I am looking for something that shows how he is guiding me. So Jill took her little pages, and then she said, oh, this is so funny, it's a bunch of old women sitting in the room, and she said, and then you take your sticky notes and you stick them together and you put it in your pocket, and when you leave the house that day, you have Scripture ready so that when someone comes to see you, somebody talks to you. It's just amazing how God will use the word you put in your pocket to come out and minister to another. But it gives you eyeballs. It kind of helps you figure out what, it, as I'm reading scripture, I want to be looking for something. And that is so easy. And I got to tell you, when my car got hit, I was pretty sure I would never drive it again. Um, I mean, I wasn't hurt. The guy was doing two miles an hour. He had been stopped, and then he just pulled out and took the whole front end off my car. Anyway, when my husband got there, he said, I don't believe we're going to be keeping this car. He said, let's just go ahead and clean it out. Guess what that car was slam full of? That scripture was decor. That car was decorating scripture. It's the sweetest thing. So it will give you something to look for. Okay, here's your simple method for my little sweet hero. That last paragraph on the front page. A simple method that I love is from Ann Graham Lotz. And you can find, how many times am I going to tell you? You can find it on YouTube. Um, you are making columns of paper. Okay, then that's all that's going to say. Then you go to the back side. But this is, I'm just going to say it real simple. When she studies, she's got three columns in a legal pad. What does the scripture say? What are lessons I can learn from this? And what does it mean to me? What is, not, excuse me, what is the message for me, which is your application? What do I do with this, okay? So I've seen what the scripture said. I've looked at a lot of lessons that can be learned, but now what do I do with it? What is the message for me? How do I act on his word? Okay, so next on the back side, move to prayer. Guess what? I've got myself another notebook. Look at this. Isn't that cute? Now, in this book, I call it Traffic with Heaven. I stole that straight from Amy Carmichael. And this is where you keep a record. So let me just tell you what goes in this book. This is all my family. This is all my friends who are in ministry. I've got a page in here for unsaved. I've got a page for college students who left college and went out into the world, and they're all over the world. I keep a list of whatever books I'm reading, and when I finish those books, I check them off. I've got a page in here that talks about where I will be speaking, and in the morning, I will check off EI because it keeps me mindful of what is coming up and how I need to be praying. If my daughter calls me and says, I've got a cold, you know what? That cold's going to be gone in two days. That doesn't go into this book. 
This is for the long-term uh, things that I just want to be mindful and I want to be praying through people. And if you'll date it so that you know when you begin to pray and then those big things of when God begins to answer, that's why Amy Carmichael says, I call this traffic with heaven. It shows that God is moving in my life. Last of all, find yourself some heroes who have written books. I love to have mentors from many, from many years ago who just kept a record because they journaled. I have the benefit of their journal in books. That's turned into devotional books. My mother and I did Streams in the Desert. Now, probably what you don't know is that our musicians are a mother-daughter team. Isn't that beautiful? And so I'm just curious, when you came to Marietta, was it a mother-daughter thing or was it a camp? Camp, okay, because I did a mother-daughter thing at Marietta. Um, anyway, one of the sweetest things in the whole wide world is to be literally on the same page with other people in your family. For me specifically, that was my mom. My mama sent me this book, and the reason it has a cloth cover is because it tore slam up. I've used it since 1981. My mama sent me this book in 1981. She also had read Streams in the Desert. Hey, you know who gave it to her? Do you remember Violet? Violet gave it to my mother. My mother was Louise, but Violet called her Louisa. And when my mother died, I found my mother's Streams in the Desert to Louisa from Violet. And my mother had used that book since 1946. In 1981, I had a real crummy, crummy, crummy summer of ministry that was rotten. And I was living in Texas, so I was in Chicago doing ministry. It was not a good summer. The guy who hired me was being fired the day that I arrived to work all summer. So needless to say, it was a tough summer. I went back to Texas. My mama knew I was struggling spiritually. And in October of 1981, she mailed me a copy, my own personal copy of Streams in the Desert. She did, we called it streams. She did streams in the morning at her house. I did streams in the morning at my house. And then you know what? We could call each other. Mama, did you love what you read this morning? So much fun. Just spiritually to be kind of moving along in the same way. I've written in here who I also love, and that is I really love little Amy Carmichael. Do I have any Amy Carmichael fans? I see those hands. That's just beautiful. I didn't even hear her for the long... I wasn't, didn't begin to be your age. This one right here, Edges of His Ways. This one stays real close to me. So if you don't know Amy, uh, let me tell you about her life. She left to go... She, had, she was in several countries before she finally landed in India, and God landed a ministry in her, li in her life. So do y'all know... I think it's called either torch lighters or lamp lighters. Okay, I love those stories, and there's a great one of Amy, and that's on Netflix, I think, um, or YouTube. Is it Netflix or YouTube? Do y'all know? Uh, okay, dig around, you'll find it. Anyway, it's cartoons, but it's stories of missionaries, and the one on Amy is fabulous. So she was in India when a temple, little child temple prostitute came to her for help, and then that turned into her whole life's ministry, and she ran an orphanage. But when she was 64, she just had a misstep literally into a hole. It did break a bone. Wasn't a big deal. However, she never walked again. And she spent her last 20 years in a great big old bedroom that they fixed up just for her and birds could fly around in the room. I mean, it was a great room. Anyway, Amy couldn't go out and work among the children, but every morning she had her quiet time. And as the Lord spoke to Amy, Amy would make a little note of it and then she would give that note to a worker who would carry that out and read it to the other workers in the morning. So, edges of his ways is just like that. So, I want to, this is why I love it. It is so simple. Amy was amazing, but her writing is so simple. I want to tell you one of my very favorite days that probably spoke the most to me. Um, who in here knows the names of Levi's son, the Levites? Anybody know their names? I'd have never known them. There were three of them. There was Kohath, there was Gershom, and there was Merari. So one day, Amy was just reading in Numbers chapter 7. Now, in Numbers chapter 7, you've gotten the children of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, and then you get to about chapter 25. They've gotten the 
Ten Commandments. And then in 25, God is going to tell them very, very, very specifically how to build the tabernacle and everything that will go in it. And at the very last chapter, verse 40, it is done, it is completed, it is put together. And then you move into Numbers where now they've got this portable tabernacle ready to go and they're ready to start traveling. And in Numbers chapter 7, they hadn't quite started moving, but God is going to give instructions. And he's going to let the Levites take care of all the tabernacle stuff. That was their job. The, Mar the Marari, his descendants, and Gershom's descendants were given oxen with carts to carry the cow hides that would be the tent covering, the tent poles. If you've ever read all that stuff, I mean, it's just amazing. Everything that put the tents together. Uh, there we go. It's telling me to hush. So this is where we're going to hush in a second. Anyway, they put all the tents, all the big makings of the tent, all of that went into these carts and oxen pulled them. The Kohathites had to put the Ark of the Covenant, the lampstand, all of that had to go on poles to be carried on their shoulders. They did not get ox carts. that had to be carried on their shoulders. Now, have I ever paid a lick of attention to that? No. But Amy read that, and she said, I wonder if the Kohathites ever thought, how come we didn't get an ox cart? How come we got to carry this stuff? It's so much harder for us. Do you ever find yourself that way? How come I didn't get? How come I didn't what? God, how come you put me in this particular thing? And Amy's whole thing was this. The Kohathites did not get the ease of having an oxen and cart to carry their stuff. They had to carry it. But they got to carry the most precious things. They weren't carrying cow hides and poles. They were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They were carrying the lampstand. They were carrying those things. Therefore, sometimes when you and I feel like, God, I think it's easier for Susie over there. How come I'm not in her circumstances? When God gives you hard things to carry, I need for you to know they are precious things. They are precious things. Because those hard things become the places out of which you and I get the ability to minister to other people who are in hard places. So if there's anything else, and I wouldn't to repeat all that. This is what I want you to hear me say. Here is your education. Here is your education on how you minister to others. You come and sit at the feet of Jesus. You get your mind right by being grateful. And then you sit down and wait until he will teach you. He'll teach the majority of it. Don't you forget, it's his word that is living and active. And one of the things that I love to say, this is Amy's. These are Amy's words. Now, she writes from Scripture, but these are Amy's words. This is the word of God. This is what's living and active. Sharper than a two-edged sword, it will divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. This is meant to be the meal. This is meant to be the appetizer. This is just to whet your appetite for the good stuff. My big joke is when I go to a Mexican restaurant, I never want food. In fact, I just order a little quesadilla because I have eaten so many chips and salsa that by the time I never, I'm never hungry. I just cram hot chips and salsa in my mouth. So I finally learned to just get a little bit. But the chips and salsa weren't really designed to be the meal any more than this is designed to be the meal. This is just an appetizer. So, anybody got questions? Ask away. Yes. Okay, I will tell you what I do. Um, I take, I ask the Lord, show me what we're going to, what do I need to memorize? And um, I used to have index cards, and then I finally realized I find these index cards all over the place, and I have long forgotten. So I get this book. Now, if I will, um, I got grandchildren all after now. I probably won't be walking today. But what I would typically do, and I prefer to learn a book because you get all of these interesting verses in the middle of nowhere that never get preached, but they're in there. And if you're memorizing the whole book, you find all these little fun places. So I will start, like if I was doing an epistle, I'm going to start with Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace. I'm going to do all of that. 
and I'm going to go all the way to the end of the book. So what I am memorizing at the moment, I can memorize that much usually in a 45-minute walk, which is about six verses. If you I'm walk, use your big muscles. I learned this from Dr. Branion too. If you'll use your big muscles while you're walking, which is either a stationary bike or a treadmill or running or walking, you've got right and left brain going at the same time. You can learn faster. I don't learn anything just sitting in a chair, but if I'll get out and walk, I can memorize all kind of stuff. And then I'll write all that down. And so today, I will memorize that. That would be 1 through 6, so tomorrow I'm going to put 7 through 12. But when I go back to memorize this much, I will find, ugh, I forgot it. But it takes about five minutes to get it back. And then I start on the new stuff. I learn the new stuff, and then I combine the two, and then I finish my walk. Then the third day comes, and I'm going to write six more verses. And I come here, and I have still forgotten this stuff. But now I can get it back in about two minutes. And then I turn the page, and I'm like, well, I forgot what I learned yesterday. Give me about five minutes, and then I'm going to add. Because this is real important to know. Your brain was wired to remember and forget, remember and forget, and the third time you remember, it's in there. Somebody taught that at school. It sounded good to me, and I believed it because it happens to me all the time. I'll feel so discouraged, but it doesn't take long to get it back. So this thing goes everywhere I go. I just keep adding to it. Used to, when I was young, I would do the whole book. So if I'm memorizing Philippians 4, I would start with Philippians 1 and work my way all the way through. Now I just stick with the, the chapter. I'm in chapter 19. And I will take this month and I will learn 19. And then next month I'll start on 20. But after I've spent a month in chapter 19... Two months down the road, I may not be able to quote chapter 19, but I believe with all my heart, I've already quoted it a hundred times. It's in my head, and God gives me recall on that. If you'll give me your email address, I have a little scripture memory. I've got a sheet that I wrote about some of the tricks of the trade. I do a lot of acronyms. But anyway, thanks for asking. Anyone else? Yes. To keep memorizing... You know, that's a great question, and it may be that I just have to ask the Lord sometimes to help me do it. I did have one, uh, one of the things when I had gotten pretty far into Scripture memory, I realized I had really gotten pretty far, and I thought, if I can, fi- All right, so I don't usually tell this because it sounds like I'm tooting my horn. I'm not tooting my horn. Um, So I'm going to tell this story first, and then I'll finish this story. So my boss at school found out that I had memorized a bunch of scripture. And one day we were sitting in a staff meeting. This was last year. And he said, "Uh, Miss Ruth, I am in 1 Corinthians 12, and I need for you to tell me uh, about verses 5 and 6. Can you tell us what verses 5 and 6 are? And it put me on the spot. I was mortified with embarrassment. And I I mean, I, I messed it up completely. And then later I thought, he might as well have asked me what size underwear George Washington wore. I mean, it was like my brain went totally blank. So I say that first to tell you that I'm, so please know I'm not tooting my horn. And what I can quote word for word right now is Exodus 19. Anything else that I went back to quote word for word, I have to, I'd have to work on it. But anyway, probably about five years ago, I realized, you know what? I bet by the time I'm 65, I could finish the New Testament. And if I finish the New Testament by the time I'm 65, I want to fly to Mount Sinai. If you go to Mount Sinai, you can start at midnight with a tour and you can climb the mountain and you wait when you get, when it's sunset or when the sun rises, you're at the top of the mountain. And so anyway, that was my motivation. About a year and a half ago, I finished the New Testament. And um, so... I think I'm going to get to go to Mount Sinai in two years. I, I wanted to go at 65, but I think I'm going to get to go do that at 67. So you know what? I went and bought myself, when I turned 65, you can get an annual pass to the parks. And so I went and bought myself a half-price annual pass, and I got myself a walking stick, and I've been walking at Paris Mountain just try, because I am anticipating one day I'm going to get to do that. So I always had stuff out there that was kind of dangling It's like a carrot dangling that I I really want to finish. I want to know all this stuff. I want to have it in my heart. And then when you find yourself real lazy, tell Jesus, would you encourage me and help me want to learn it? Somebody else. Yes. 
That is a great question. Probably Revelation. <laughs> um, it is wordy, for one thing. And then it's just a whole lot of stuff that is all these scorpions. And <laughs> I mean, it's some amazing stuff. <laughs> and it's not exactly in the... Um, like when you're reading Colossians, and he's telling them to clothe yourself with all these little sweet things. Yeah, you know, those things kind of make sense in our brain. Revelation would have been the hardest. And I'm going to tell you when I get to the part of Exodus where I'm going to be listing 50 gold hooks and 49 poles, I'm going to probably struggle through some of that too. But I'm determined I'm going to get to chapter 40 where they got it all put together just as the Lord had commanded. Somebody else. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. What was my favorite one? Uh, you want to hear the funniest thing? It's probably the first one I ever learned. Philippians was my favorite book, so that's why I went that. And that was my first book I ever learned. And that's probably the book that would probably take me, I bet in an hour I could get all four, all four chapters back where I could quote it word for word because it was so powerful in my life. Good question. On my read, yeah, I will. I'll tell you what I do. If I'm behind on my reading, especially if I'm in a book kind of like Joshua, where it's real bloody and hard, or Leviticus, when I'm learning about what to do if you got mildew and mold in your house. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there are just some books that are harder. I'm not planning to memorize Leviticus. Um, I will. I've got an audio phone. I mean, an audio Bible on my phone, and if I get behind. Then I will have my I'll have my phone with me to let me help me get caught up, and uh, that way, if I'm putting on makeup, no matter what I'm doing, you know, I can have that phone and it's speaking the word over me. Or you can program it so you can listen to it in the car, because it is. A, I hate that feeling of being way behind, and um, so kind of helps me get caught up. Anybody else? I'm seeing 11.15, so let me give you my final story. And this comes from Amy Carmichael, who said that she was reading in 2 uh, Timothy 2, 20 and 21, where it talks about that there are different articles for the house. Some had noble purposes, some not so much. And um, she said as she was reading that, what really struck her is that there's nowhere in Scripture that anybody ever prays that, God, will you use me? She said, that's never in Scripture. There's never the prayer, please, God, use me. Uh, Isaiah does say, here am I, send me, but it's in response to a question. So what really struck her was, if nobody ever models that prayer, use me, why not and whatever? So in Timothy, he talks about keeping those vessels clean so that they will be prepared for use. Um, you're loving this. Is this, um, have you got that memorized or is that just a part you love? Okay, did you happen to hear what Amy said about it? You're going to love it. So Amy was looking at this particular scripture and she said what hit her. Now keep in mind, I think she uh, died maybe in 1940. I'm not sure when she died, but keep in mind this is old stuff. So she was a writer. She was bedridden, so writing was a big deal for her. She used a cartridge. She used cartridge pens. And she said, I have three pens. One is for keeping things like a grocery list. You know, it's just kind of a junk pen. I've got another one that I do my writing. And then I have a real fine tip cartridge pen where I do editing and correcting over the things I've written. So she had three specific pens that she used. And she said, uh, you know, she's crippled. So she had a worker. One worker would come and plunge those cartridge ink pens down into hot water to clean them every Sunday to get her ready for Monday. And then uh, she had a worker that kept her pens filled. And she said, my pens do not say, use me, use me, write something with me. No, they are always sitting at hand. They are clean and they are filled so that all I have to do is reach and take. But because they're always prepared for good works, because they're always ready, I can use them always. And then that became her prayer, that she would stay clean before the Lord, stay confessed up, and then stay filled with the Spirit, filled with the Word, filled with the knowledge of the Word. And then she said, if I am those things, then I'm prepared and God can use me 
every day. And I love that. So that's my charge to you. Stay clean. Stay filled. And he'll do the cleaning. All you got to do is just ask him. And ask him sometimes. God, show me what all needs to be cleaned up. Because sometimes we're, we're blind to it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a privilege to be at hand. To be prepared for you to use. And what an incredible thing. When all of a sudden we realize you really have reached out. You've taken hold of us. And you have used us in the life of another. Oh, Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would take these girls and that you would give them a heart to love your word, to know your word, to study your word, to memorize your word, and then use that word for the sake of others. First in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Can I tell you one last story? All right, you know, I told you I'm a hiker. Um, this year, my word, I should have brought it. I bought a little bitty menorah, you know, the, light, the lamp stand. And um, because this year, I'm asking the Lord to help me be light. I work in a concrete company. I want to be light to those people. I want to light the path for the ones who come to me in biblical counseling to help them. So I'm always praying. I was up on Paris Mountain. I was hiking. It frustrates me that hikers don't speak to each other. They don't even look at each other half the time. They're just walking. And I'm like, you could at least look up and say, hey, you don't have to talk to me. Just be nice. Anyway, so I climbed 8,000 feet that day, and I was climbing back, coming back down. And I told the Lord, I want to be light. Let me be light. Let me be light on this mountain. I just want to be light. I want the expression of my face and the way that I greet. I'll, I'll keep walking. I'm not going to stop them. But I want them to see your light in me somehow or another. I came down. I was 500 feet from the bottom of the trail. There was a man coming up. I was coming down. The trail's narrow. I usually kind of step to the side. And um, he kind of stepped to the side. We sort of laughed. And he said, may I ask where you've been walking? And I told him where I had been. And he said, well, ma'am, I don't know how to say this, but when I looked up and saw you on the trail... You looked like light. And I busted out crying. I am a follower of Jesus. <laughs> I have been asking the Lord to let me be light all the way down the mountain. He said, well, God heard your prayer. Um, anyway, this is what I want you to know. I wasn't singing. I wasn't quoting scripture. I wasn't giving away candy. I asked the Lord, will you be light in me? And he answered it. So, you know, do it. All right, we get a break? All right, okay. Oh, you are so welcome.